Would you like to support Cubs Out Loud? One way is to join us over on Patreon. For as little as a buck a month, patrons get early access to our shows, the pre and post show, and various other rewards. You can learn more at patreon.com slash Cubs Out Loud. Thanks to all of our patrons for their support in making this podcast. It's Sunday, July 9th, 2023. I'm Jeff. Who's your bear? That's right. I am your bear. I'm Damon. I don't brew the tea. I just serve it. That makes me Gary. Everyone else is thinking it, and I just say it. Welcome to Cubs Out Loud, the Bear Podcast of Indeterminate Length, episode number 701. And I talked about it before. Not sure if this title really works exactly right, but it is, does, and it's. Yeah, I'm a little confused, but you know what? Let's talk about sex, Gary. Yes. Would this be an L T A S H? A latch. A cash. Latash, sure. Latash. I'm dyslexic. <laughs> hey, in my brain, I took out the T at first. I was like, lash, but I didn't, then I realized, no, I need to count lash. the T. Yes. <laughs> Anyways, so a year ago, we discussed social media and the development of monkeypox cases in the MSM community. Uh, so, guess what? It hasn't gone away, it's still out there, kids. And it's mm. summer season, and cases are starting to rise. So, you know the way that most people are getting it? Could it be... Let's could it be... <laughs> there you go! <laughs> they decide to be a freak and deek, and... They're either not vaccinated, which va- mm. vaccines are not 100%. For Fair. the record, uh, but they do help mitigate your symptoms, the potential of like what will happen. Um, like in the case of COVID, vaccinations will most likely help eliminate the you getting uh, hospitalized. It's not a guarantee, but if anything, it will reduce symptoms and have you possibly not end up in the ICU intubated. Mm-hmm. So. When it comes to MPOX, uh, which, by the way, got renamed since we talked last year. Oh. Yes. Uh, it's now um, known as MPOX. Previously, it was originally named as Monkeypox. But lots of advocates of different folks came forward and said, do we really need to do this? Can we not like move forward with the naming conventions of diseases and perhaps not tie them directly to animals? Because you Remember what happened last time when we called it swine flu? And by the way, is it now seed pox? Is what? Or chicken pox? Uh, I don't think that's been addressed yet. No. Probably because it's not as severe. Yeah. And well, and, I... and there there was also a huge amount of consternation about the fact that M pox was affiliated with the MSM community and. Mm potentially also persons of color and right so you can start seeing how like people would the the ball was rolling in a certain direction and people right and people "Mm -hmm." and people would misunderstand like for instance like hiv for a very long time was believed to have come from primates it is theoretically historically been determined that it came as a variant off of a former virus that was within 
certain animal communities, like these are all zoological based viruses. Right. So anyways, all that being said, yes, it's been renamed. So in case you see like M pox, that's what we're talking that's about. It. Got it. That yeah. makes sense. So Which but it could just be like a contraction of <laughs> the word anyway. Right. Well, and that's one of the things. So like, you know, COVID-19 people originally a lot of a number of people were thinking like this is the 19th like generation mm-hmm. 19th version um but anyways like it's like no <laughs> there was a naming convention for a reason anyways i'm not going to get into that here it, the whole point is like it's a virus it's contagious um this one in particular is incredibly painful as a symptom for some people um and it causes permanent scarring Mm -hmm. so if you have the option or the opportunity to get vaccinated and you fall into a category of someone who is considered a priority population you should probably go get vaccinated yes damon no just i just looked at the so I know we had had the map, the U.S., the 2022 um, map and case count per, which broke it down by state. Mm-hmm. And I just noticed, I mean, it's not a big number when you think of the broader scheme of like the broader sense of the population of the state. But I'm at, state of Ohio has 396 cases so far, which is, I mean, in comparison to us around it, it's about the same. But when you go to, say, you know, Pennsylvania or Illinois or Virginia, it starts to increase. Right. And there's something to be said for population density. Like, mm-hmm. so, like, New York City is in New York, but, you know, and so New York State has 4,277 cases since it started last year. Mm-hmm. But New York City is within that, and so it gets counted within the state. So, right. and then there's Pennsylvania and New Jersey, which border against New York. So, there's potential for clustering mm-hmm. of like cases in those yeah. areas. So, so one yeah. of the so last year we talked about this, but it bears repeating. I know I was fortunate. Um, to be made aware of it through, believe it or not, um, World Bear Weekend, um, the event I was going to, they mm-hmm. put out a notification and kind of said, hey, like cases are rising. Um, we highly recommend you get vaccinated. And in Florida in particular, um, the cases were quite high. So, um um, I worked with my primary, no, 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 that's not right. I went through the health department here, mm-hmm. um, and got vaccinated. I made a, um, made an appointment, well, technically two, um, and got vaccinated last year. So I guess the next the question I have, Gary, since you're bringing this topic up, is that vaccination long term? Good question. Uh, a webinar that I recently sat in on that Dr. D- Dr. Dimitri Daskalakis, who's like head of the MPOC situation via the White House and has been um, the director of HIV with the CDCP, he did uh, actually talk about that very thing that there is not currently any clinical determination regarding vaccination timeline like Mm -hmm. as far as it lasts. And so the expectation is until further notice, if you got your two dose regimen of Genios, that's it for the time Mm -hmm. being. Um, So it's not exactly making people super excited, Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Yeah. So if you did the thing last year, if you felt you were at risk, and you got your vaccination last year, you should be okay right now. So don't feel like you have to run back out to 
your health department or whatever to get another vac- vaccine. You should be good. But, right, and there's and there's no <laughs> scientific like study or proof at the moment that if you got a third dose that it would do anything right. in terms of like changing your immunity or <laughs> reaction to it. Um, yeah. So if you were a person who got one dose um, last year because of the supply shortage issue, which has now <laughs> been addressed, uh, then yes, going and getting your second dose is perfectly fine, even if it's been quite a while. Yeah. Um, you know. Obviously, contact your local health department if you don't feel that your PCP um, is one to discuss these things with, or if you don't have an infectious disease like doctor because of a you know certain thing that you're already dealing with, whatever that may be. Yeah, and you can also like check stuff out. We've got a series of links we're going to include for the CDCP. So Centers of Disease Control and Prevention has a a number of things available. The one thing I like that they have done is they've added things that were never really quite there before. So like we have a link for safer sex and social gatherings. Um, Nice. Dr. Dimitri being an out gay man um, who is, who came from New York City, came from the kink like scene, like is very much proactive on the go to the community understand their culture and like help them determine best what they should be doing because he was a person who directly saw like how hiv affected the gay community and Mm -hmm. what that was like and how those things worked and didn't work especially so i appreciate that he's very much like people hook up people have sex that's how it goes yeah, like they go to bathhouses, they go to raves, they go to Pride Fest. You know, they do all these different things. <laughs> right. So yeah. Um. So there's hmm. some there's some good stuff in there that I appreciate that they put yeah. together. Um. Like there's a explanation about all social gatherings are not the same. Festivals, events, and concerts where attendees are fully clothed and unlikely to share skin to skin contact are considered safer. However, attendees should be mindful that activities like kissing can also help spread mpox. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas a rave or a party or a club where there can be minimal clothing and there is much higher prevalence of direct personal skin to skin contact that puts people at risk. So this is mostly essentially this is past skin to skin contact it's touching getting in contact with infected in this with the sores or with the rash right so what happens is um you have closer intimate contact with another person and the reason why jeff you were talking about like this being ltah versus ltas is the thing that came different about mpox this time around was that Cases left the predominant countries where ongoing cases were occurring, like historically for decades. Most of the time when cases came to the U.S. or to other countries, um, then it was typically that the person traveled. Mm. So they traveled to a known country where there was a lot of exposure and or it came with animals who were carrying the virus at that time. And and because those paths were not quite the same this past year, plus there was a prevalence in the MSM community, specifically in Europe and then in the UK. And that was the whole thing that kind of started raising a lot of alarm right. bells is that the, the predominant caseload, the initial cases in 2022, were men who have sex with men. Yeah. And that's when people were like, well, that's a little unusual. Had it happened before? Yeah. Yeah, but not quite to this degree. And what's been interesting about it is, so like, if you go read the CDC's website, it says, is MPOX a sexually transmitted infection? And the answer is, in the current MPOX outbreak, the virus is spreading primarily through sexual contact. However, infections have occurred through other exposures, including non-sexual contact with infectious lesions, and from contaminated instruments in clinical settings. Right. So unlike HIV that has a very short life outside of the host, meaning the human body, MPOX is different. Mm. 
So that's why there's all this thoroughness about like if you have someone in your home about not like contacting them or any of the items they're in contact with, like linens, especially like bed sheets, towels, those kind of things. So like there's cleaning procedures, all these precautionary type stuff. So that's where it gets a little interesting because this is a infectious like state from a virus that has never really been considered an STI. It isn't really considered like something like, is it possible? Absolutely. Like it's always been possible that you could pass MPOX from person to person through sex. Right. I mean, technically you can pass COVID from person to person through sex. Right. So that's, that's kind of the part where I think people, you know, get a little alarmed. Um, there's also been some, you know, cases reported of animals like domesticating animals being carriers mm. um, and what to do about that. So, you know, and they address that as well. It, so I find that interesting that they have tried to, you know, put information out there and make sure that people are aware, know what they're thinking about, what to look for, um, you know, in that case. But yeah, there's, there's a bunch of different things. Um, and then, you know, if you go to look on the website, you'll see there's also some pictures of some of the lesions and rash type things and what they look like. I will tell you this. It is not exactly a pleasant um, circumstance. And that was a big thing that happened last year when the original cases were coming out is that most individuals felt shamed um, that they like they really felt they couldn't go anywhere or do anything because people were going to judge them because if the lesions, you know, if these um, physical indications of the rash are seen in like, you know, common areas like on the face, on hands, on arms, possibly on legs, uh -huh. you know, that people will shy away and not want to be around you or have anything to do with you. Um, and, no offense against the gay community, but gay men tend to be very vain. No. <laughs> so, you know. I have a, I have a... I need what was that? <gasps> oh, yeah, yeah exactly. The club acting, <laughs> but still. Yeah. Um, one of the other things to be aware of is that as of February this year, 2023, new data showed that people can spread MPOX from one to another within one to four days before symptoms actually appear. Interesting. So a person could be asymptomatic. We used to talk about this during COVID when I worked on it, that individuals have that window of time where they have the virus and they're not um, exhibiting anything that indicates that they have right. you know an, an altered uh, physical or medical condition at that time so it's another reason why it's important to pay attention be aware if you can get vaccinated ask your partners questions mm -hmm. like are they vaccinated are they aware where have they been what have they done um, you know, like we just had pride, many, many, many prides, um, occurring in the month of June and just a simple, what people would not think of as a sex event, mm -hmm. like people going to a pride fest or pride parade, even right. though they're not hooking up necessarily. I mean, people could be, but most likely the vast majority are not at said thing. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that people won't be coming into contact with other people, especially right. people you haven't seen in a while. Mm -hmm. So you're like giving them hugs, holding hands, giving them kisses, you know. Yeah. Um, so if if this holds true that the current kind of global outbreak situation is that people could, you know, not have symptoms for a couple of days, that's something else to keep in mind. Yeah. Which makes it that much harder to do what we call contact tracing, where you want to work it backwards and figure out where the exposure took place and then who the potential source was. Mm -hmm. So 
it's like, well, I don't know. I mean, yeah, back on Saturday, I went to this event and there was like 6,000 people at it. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> this is not exactly so, the... So, you know, just, you know, one of the big things that just happened this last weekend was we had the Taylor Swift concert um, here in town. Mm-hmm. And... Um, it was a big event. There was a whole bunch of stuff going on downtown. I'm so glad I didn't do anything. <laughs> um, but there was that. There was there were um, sports games. There were other events. It was crazy. A bunch of people all over the place. Like and it, you know, this is one of those situations where something like that could happen if someone got there and happened to be infected and either knew or didn't know. Um, now, it's a lesser risk situation because I doubt someone's going to be at the Taylor Swift concert naked. I mean, you do you, but um, one would assume that they're not going to be. Right. Um, so you have that, quote unquote, going for you, but you never know. Um, considering where I've seen people that have had the sores and lesions come from it it may be easy to see it may not be and you don't really know and now that we know that they can be symptomatic they can be asymptomatic for one to four days those sores those lesions may not be there um until three you know three four days later so it can be even harder i like you said i think it could be even that could be even harder to trace back because you know some people can't even remember what they did two days ago let alone right four or five and and the thing is that most people show like symptoms within three weeks of exposure which Mm. complicates things so like not only do you have that very short window where there's like nothing like there's no rash that's that's the very first key indication symptom so you have one to four days where there might not be a rash at all and then the rash starts, but the rash goes through several phases or stages. And if you aren't thinking about it, like you're not necessarily paying attention to the early stages because you might think like you just came into contact with something. Like mm-hmm. maybe you brushed up against something, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you're a person who kind of utilizes um, scent free, like chemical cleaning things like laundry detergent and fabric softener and like um, shower hygiene products that don't really have like, you know, scents or colors or anything in them. You might think like, oh, I must have come into contact with something. And that's why I'm having this like localized reaction Uh and not, not really like consider it it more. Yeah. You know, usually once people start having what we call typical physical symptoms of infection, so like fever, chills, swollen lymph nodes, um, body aches, uh, you know, muscle soreness, those type of things, like, you know, physical symptoms that are very much indicative of your immune system fighting off something, then that's when people might be like, oh, I don't know what this is about. I'm not quite sure where this came from or whatever. So... Uh, yeah, it's it's one of those things, you know, to to be aware of. So the point of this was m- mostly a update to say, one, hasn't gone away. Two, yeah. go get your shots if you can. Um, there are lots of resources, information available. Uh, they should have no cost to you. You could be you could have a request when you go to get your vaccination to provide insurance information, um, but there will be no cost related to you. There should not be a cost related to you for it. Um, it most likely will be for just like a billing purpose for record keeping that it was administered, those type of things, not specifically uh-huh. that you have to have any type of like copay or any of that kind of stuff. So, but yeah. Huh. It's a thing. It's still out there. It's still going on uh, and it's still spreading and everyone's kind of holding their breath at the moment because the end of June is when we see the most activity as far as like pride events, um, festivals, parades, parties, that kind of stuff. And so now that we're at 
July 9th, we are kind of like just all waiting in public health to see if there's going to be this explosion of cases or not. Mm -hmm. There have been a few cases. There have been reports of, you know, cases ticking up and stuff. Mostly what I've seen is that the reports are of other countries seeing like doublings of cases week after week. Mm -hmm. Um, But again, like that's not necessarily indicative of things here. Um, and I think sometimes people get uh, disconnected or disassociated and they're like, oh, well, I heard that like California, like L.A. Uh, had a lot of cases recently. But right. I, I live, you know, in Ohio, Newport, Kentucky. Right. Like, that doesn't mean anything to me. And it's like, well, <laughs> well, that may have been true 100 years ago, but we live in a global society now. So do you know what people do a lot of? Travel. So they get on planes, they get on trains, they drive cross country and they hook up all along the way. And (laughs) planes, trains, and all the hills. Cross country hoe trip. Like (laughs) I mean, I was thinking about this last summer. There were there was a chat room I was in that people were having conversations about like whether or not they would go to a bathhouse for a while because they were Mm. just concerned that you don't know who else is there. Um fair. Now, to help people understand, if you're not familiar with the concept of a, of a bathhouse, um, which I'm pretty sure we've discussed before in a different episode, at least once, if not more. Pretty sure. I mean, um, do a fun little check. The thing is, is that, you know, while the bathhouse does require ID to have access and you pay a fee, so they have a record of who's there as a guest, that's not public information. You don't get to ask the bathhouse, you know, attendant or the manager or any of the staff and be like, hey, is Damon here from Cubs Out Loud? Like, first of all, they wouldn't even know what the hell the second part of that <laughs> is. You know, they they wouldn't be able to reveal that in any way, shape or form. Um, so you're basically in a building with other anonymous people unless they happen to reveal themselves to you. And by that, I mean. Did they tell you and who they are? Tell their name. <laughs> I mean, depending on where you're at the bathhouse, they're they're pretty much revealed. <laughs> Correct. But uh, yeah it it's been interesting to me, like going to um World Bear, kind of in the midst of this uh this you know situation happening. Was there concern for people? I feel like there was, but but they like the run was not requiring people to be like like to show that they were vaccinated from for impox. But um, could they could they have? I mean, maybe they could have asked people to be, but also I think they probably didn't because they knew that it was not in um, it was not as available. Um, but they did right. offer, um, there was a, um, is it the health department? Yeah, there was a provider. Yeah, there yeah. was a provider at, at the run itself that was providing, um, vaccinations, at least your initial, if our, our maybe second shot. So, you know, they took the precautions that they could mm-hmm. and then let you be your own judge you know on what he wanted to do right um and i'm you know people had people had fun dark rooms were had things happen um you know to my knowledge i don't believe anyone came out of that event affected so at least with not with impact i think there was uh, um, some COVID cases but um Again, you do this at your, you do these things at your own risk. You take the assessment of yourself and what you're comfortable with. You know, me being vaccinated at this point, I would feel um, I would feel more comfortable expressing and having you know fun times uh, without worry, as it were. Right. Um, but I also consider myself 
more knowledge of the fact, probably due, somewhat due to this podcast itself, but uh, um, also being aware of my sexual health and staying aware of my sexual health because of my being on prep. Right. Um, so it's the choice is yours to make, and being aware of the risk at any event is going to help you navigate it better than say just not doing anything at all right i mean something to keep in mind of like when you're looking at the data historically where we were last year the height of the U u.s cases were in the beginning of august of 2022 mm. um we've really seen a change in that trending for this particular year um, in 2023, the height of the cases, which is not technically comparable, but the highest point in the calendar year was way back in late January. Mm. So at this same time this year, the number of new cases is nowhere near what it was last year. So there's a high probability that messaging has worked, getting vaccinated has worked, um, you know, having awareness, those type mm -hmm. of things has been beneficial. But that doesn't mean that we won't see Mm -hmm. you know cases rising again or having like, stuff come up yeah. like everything don't rest on the laurels don't be like oh well you know everyone else is getting vaccinated so i don't need to worry about it no don't let that happen don't let that be your thing don't um if you are able to get vax the vaccine go get it and just for your personal safety but if you're also not engaging in quote-unquote risky behavior then you you should be okay. Right. Like if you're a person who's not very, act, very much active, um, hasn't really been with anybody in an, in, you know, a significant period of time, you can still go get vaccinated. There's nothing wrong with that. Just right. like you can still get yourself prepped for HIV. Nothing mm -hmm. wrong with that. Um, you know, the, but your risk is being going to be considered minimal. Right. As opposed to somebody who, you know, is putting themselves at exposure quite a bit. Something else to be aware of, um, which is what something that the CDCP has been criticized for quite a bit. Uh, when it comes to MPOX cases in terms of race and ethnicity, um, nearly two thirds of all cases here in the U.S. are between the black and Hispanic communities. Right. Um, and there's been a lot of like kind of pointing out that. Yet again, if you're white, you have accessibility, you have the means, you have the funds, you have like uh -huh. opportunities. Um, and, you know, also there's something to be said in recognition, you know, that communities of color are reluctant to trust health authorities uh -huh. because there aren't necessarily studies done with those populations to provide information. Um, and there's also, you know, shame, stigma, right. Disparities of health. You know, there's, there's a lot of stuff that goes into that. Um, and I think it's important that people recognize and, and know those things, um, but also do what they can. That's what was interesting about this webinar that I ended up viewing was, it was put on by um, NMAC, which I think is the National Minority Advisor AIDS Council, AIDS Coalition, I think. And um, what was interesting about it is that Dr. Dimitri's a guest and one of the other presenters who to me presented as like a, like I would say uh, cisgender black male in their 30s wasn't unprofessional or rude, but called out and said like, you are not working with us effectively in our communities to assure that this is available and that uh -huh. it is being done fairly and equitably. Um, and so, you know, and, and, you know, had a very strong, but, you know, uh, expressed opinion uh -huh. and said, you know, it's like, it's all great and fine and dandy that you have, you know, these things available and so on and so forth. Like, you know, and, and, and they weren't mean about it, but they were like the numbers alone prove that this has been a failure in these areas. Uh -huh. Point blank, period. And I was like, and there we go. 
and, and Dr. Dimitri was really good about how they handled it um, and said, like, you're the type of people that we need to be having conversations with. We need your input. We need your assistance in trying to determine how to get the messaging out, how to be more effective. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's what I really like about him is that he recognizes, like, I only know so much. I only do so much. Like, and, you know, there, yes, there's a lack of representation in public health for, from communities of color, like people who work in the field. Um, and, you know, that, and there's also, you know, more complications I don't want to get into about, like, you know, the communities of color not being included in studies, um, some of the debate has recently been about the fact that it's not that there is an opportunity to be in the studies. There's a reluctance to be in a study. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like, well, no offense. <laughs> Shit's been kind of fucked for a very long time. So there's a, there is a lot of distrust. Right. And it's going to take a lot to gain that trust back. Right. So, so yeah, it's, it's um, one of those things that, you know, people want to, see improvements in obviously so that's also another thing to you know be aware of um when it comes to to this kind of stuff all that is to say simply it, it ain't gone away it's still a thing be aware um you know look up information we've got like i said a series of links that we put here uh mostly pretty much all from the cdc p i realize that for people that's probably kind of you know biased um the the thing that's a distinction i want people to know is that yes it is a government entity but it's also a government entity based in science right so and the thing that people don't like to hear about science is that science can change so like if you read through the website and you look at things and they talk about the number of reported cases they explain if you read it that historical data can be adjusted when you know more than you like accurately take that into, into account, it's kind of like bookkeeping. Uh -huh. So you think you're done with your taxes at the beginning of the year, you close out your books and everything. And then a month later, this random piece of mail shows up and is like, Oh, don't you remember you won $200 in this raffle thing? You have to claim that. Mm. And you're like, what? <laughs> and you're like, I don't even, I barely even remember that happening. You know what I mean? Like, um, and I use it as an analogy of like how things after the fact come along and then you go back and you adjust accordingly. Um, contact tracing can be that way. So like a person, like we said, you know, can go for weeks without being symptomatic and then, you know. They talk to them, they find out who they've been in contact with, and then they end up discovering other people that were unreported. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, some people like are like, oh, but you're cooking the books and you're making the numbers bigger. And it's like, well, we're trying to be accurate. Right. So that's how that works. They can also go down if there was a, a false presentation, but that's very, very, very rare. Right. Um, there's more hesitancy in the front end about being accurate then like i mean i know this is a thing within covid that sometimes people not withheld numbers but were concerned about the accuracy of information mm. because if it looks like there was a big jump how accurate is that because what you right. don't want to do is say there's like 300 cases and then suddenly there's 600 cases and then like a week or two later there's like 400 cases it's like okay well wait which is it right so yeah there's that stuff but that's kind of the, the basics of it not really a whole lot in depth um other than you know we're at a much different place the stockpile is available people can get vaccinated as we've been talking about uh -huh. you know be cautious know know the stuff read up on it um contact people if you have questions you know and uh please let others know right. if you've been exposed if you think that you know, there's a potential that you may have exposed others. Exactly. It's treatable. It's livable. It's not a, it's not a chronic condition. It does resolve itself, but still. Yeah. There's that. Yeah. Any questions? 
None more here. He's safe. Yeah. Yeah. This is pretty much it. Cool. Guess that's the end. Didn't think that, that we would have a show this quick, huh? Well, there you go. There's plenty of ways to contact us. <clears throat> you can pop over to our website, CubsOutLoud.com. Uh, shoot us an email at CubsOutLoud at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail. It's 361 Talk. That's 361 265 8255. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube at CubsOutLoud in the appropriate place of the URL. Join our entourage chat at bit.ly slash telegram dash col or subscribe to our Google Calendar to see when we're planning or recording these shows at bit.ly slash calendar dash col. You can get various equipment such as the Cubs Out Loud logo, either the version 3 or the version 1 or the version 2, or consent is my foreplay shirt. Many different designs. Uh, some of those designs were designed by Smashy. Uh, you can find more of his work at uh, tpublic.com slash user slash Smashy the Bear. You can find all of our stuff at zazzle.com slash Cubs Out Loud. I don't think I said that. I'm getting things in reverse. That's okay. <laughs> you can also become a patron at patreon.com slash Cubs Out Loud, where you can uh, get shout outs during our uh, What's Going On episodes, and uh, you can get the recordings of the pre and post shows at patreon.com slash comes out loud or send us a donation at paypal.me slash comes out loud uh you find us on basically any podcasting platform especially popular ones such as apple Podcasts, google play and spotify find me anywhere on the internet as box set box puppy box cub box something or other maybe i'm just not that much on the internet anymore so i'm not going to make any promises Damon, you can find you. They just may not. You just may not be able to talk to them. Well, you just may not. <laughs> you say may anything. not interact. You may just not interact. Um, if you wish to get in touch with me, you can find me on most beer related sites or on Facebook as Theater Cub Seven Nine. That's T H E A T R E C U B Seven Nine. Um, I am also on Twitter at Pup underscore Umbra. Um, that Twitter is definitely not safe for work. Gary. If you would like to get in touch with me, you can pretty much find me anywhere online as Gerber73. And with that, say good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Have a good one, y'all. <laughs>